Uh, okay, so um, hi everyone. My name is Jin Su Park, and I recently transitioned to the University of Chicago as a Chicago Prize Postdoctoral Fellow in Theoretical Quantum Science. And today I'll talk about first principles electron phonon interaction, uh, the workflow for computing uh, electron phonon interaction and dynamics in Viterbo, the fundamentals, and some recent developments. So uh in this lecture i'll talk about two main topics the first one is the first principle electron phonon interaction itself uh how we do electron phonon interpolation short range and long range interactions and some quadrupole electron phonon interaction and in the second part i'll talk about electron phonon interactions beyond uh normal density functional theory gw correction spin polarized systems spin orbit coupling and even correlated electron systems so uh, let's talk about electron phonon matrix elements. The electron phonon matrix elements, as we have seen in the first lecture, is the overlap matrix between two block states and a phonon perturbation potential. So let's look at this diagram here. Uh, initial electron at a band index n and momentum k gets scattered into a different band with band index m and momentum k plus q by absorbing or emitting a phonon with phonon uh, mode index nu and phonon uh, momentum q. This type of uh, overlap matrix is quantized as here, uh, g n m nu k q, which is the calculation that you see here. If you plot this quantity uh, for different materials as a function of the phonon momentum, uh, where I show here for gallium arsenide and MOS, MOS2, you can see that it's not a single number. It varies rapidly with the phonon momentum and also the phonon uh, mode index. So accurately obtaining these quantities is the key for accurate charge transport and electron dynamics that is done in perturbo. So let me briefly remind you of the electron phonon workflow that's done in perturbo. So first, we start from quantum espresso. We perform density functional theory and DFPT calculations to obtain band and the wave functions and phonons and phonon perturbation potentials on a coarse set of grids, KC and QC. And then inside Perturbo, uh, we compute the electron phonon matrix elements, G, N, N, K, C, Q, C on coarse K and Q grids. And then we use the Vanier 90 to compute the maximally localized Vanier functions for these computed density functional theory electronic structure and transform these electron phonon matrix elements in coarse grids to uh, localized real space spaces. And I'll talk about this part more in, uh, in the future slides. And then we move ahead to interpolate the electron phonon matrix elements into arbitrary fine K and Q grids. Uh, and we use them on the fly to compute transport and dynamics. So first, let me talk about this part here, the electron phonon interpolation. Workflow. So why do we need interpolation at all? That's because Interpolation is essentially very uh, crucial for obtaining the electron phonon matrix elements. We need a very dense grid of electron phonon matrix elements, uh, typically of order 100 by 100 by 100 for both K and Q grid. And this is impractical if you want to do it using density function perturbation theory and even almost impossible. So let me give you an example. This is the transport distribution function of electrons in the elements as a function of electron energy. Uh, if we integrate the function here, we get the mobility, the electron mobility of gallium arsenide. So let's say we use 80 cubed K grid for computing the mobility, we get this number. And then you, even if you go to 100 cubed, uh, the mobility, mobility itself is not conversion. We need at least 600 cubed K and Q grids to compute the electron mobility of gallium arsenide. This is impossible to do in density function of perturbation theory. You would need petabytes of data. So, okay, what's done here? We use a coarse grid of points, about 10, 10 by 10 by 10, uh, that are computed from density function of perturbation theory, as you can see here. And then we use interpolations to go to finer and finer grids with order of 100 by 100 by 100. So why can this be done? In order to, let, uh, um, in order to tell you that, let me first talk about electron phonon matrix elements in real space. 
electron photon matrix elements in real space is the Fourier transform of the electron photon matrix elements in the reciprocal space. So uh, here we have the electron photon matrix elements in the reciprocal space where the electrons are in block wave functions and the phonons are in phonon mode and momentum index. If you do a Fourier transformation, double Fourier transformation, then what we have here is the electron photon matrix elements in real space. That's now the overlap matrix or the interaction between two localized bases that can be either in one year functions or atomic orbitals uh, by a phonon perturbation uh, that's in the basis of atom and displacement um, basis. What's, what's good about this? Because uh, we need this quantity because uh, if we have this quantity in data, uh, we can, uh, the electron photon interaction is mostly short range. What does that mean? So if you take the distance between two of these localized spaces, if you take them farther and farther apart, it goes very fast rapidly to zero. So if you show, if you, you see this graph here, uh, as we increase the distance between these two localized spaces, we can see that this uh, matrix element goes very rapidly to zero. And note that this y-axis here is involved. Uh, logarithmic scale. This is true for both the atomic orbitals or the money function basis. So if we make an assumption that this interaction is non-zero only if the electron distance and the displacement position are within a few atomic displaced uh, atomic distances apart, and then what we can do is to in to an uh, inverse Fourier transformation to obtain the electron photon matrix elements on arbitrary uh, reciprocal space grid k prime q prime grids. If you want to know more about the details uh, of electron phonon one function interpolation or the atomic orbital interpolation, uh, uh, you can look into these two references here. And if you want to learn more about the one functions, then uh, I'll then you can look into this reference right here. So okay. Let me give you an example of what the interpolation results look like. So I'll use silicon and diamond as an example here. Uh, for the initial band, I'll use the balance band maximum at the gamma point. And for the final uh, band, I'll use the balance band maximum here. And for the phonons, I'll use this specific phonon mode. So if you plot this electron phonon matrix elements, uh, this graph on the right is what we have, uh, where this Part here is the interpolation using one year functions. And this part here is the interpolation using atomic orbitals. And the upper panel is for silicon and the lower panel is for diamond. So as you can see, uh, first of all, the results from density function of perturbation theory are given in black uh, solid line. And in uh, red or green or blue line are the ones from the interpolation. So as you can see, the interpolated results are in very good agreement with the direct density function for the base theory calculations. If you use the Vanya function, then one very good property of the Vanya functions is that the coarse grid points are exactly reproduced. Uh, however, if you use the Vanya functions, one drawback is the generation of the Vanya functions. This can be uh, very non-intuitive non for uh, many types of materials. If you use atomic orbitals, it's the opposite. If you use atomic orbitals, a drawback is that the coarse grid points are not exactly reproduced. However, we do not need to generate the atomic orbitals. Currently, Perturbo supports uh, the Vanya function interpolation of the electron form of elements. Now, if you look closely at this point here, uh, so I magnified it on the right here, you can see that the density function of perturbation theory results are not matching the interpolated results. This is true even if you use four cubed or six cubed or eight cubed Q points. This type of interaction is due to the long range electron phonon interactions. Sorry, why do you have different values at the gamma points? At the gamma point, oh, you mean this part here? No, or in the middle four graphs. Middle four graphs. Oh, you mean this part and this part? Yeah, this gamma point and the Gamma point on the right. Ah, yes. So these, so it's the same gamma point, but the va value depends on whether you're going from that 
Q direction, or you're approaching the gamma point from that different Q direction. This is also due to the long range electron photon interaction. And it's uh, the long range electron photon interaction are uh, generally non analytical uh, interaction. So they're not very well behaved near the gamma. There are two main types of long-range electron photon interactions. So if an atom moves in a solid, it can create a dipole charge moment, a quadruple charge moments, or optical and higher charge moments. The dipole and the quadruple moments are responsible for these long-range electron photon interactions. So here, the electron photon interaction is not short range, so it goes across many, many uh, atomic distances. And brute force interpolation using Fourier transformation is not very effective. So the first one is the Frawley interaction. And this type of interaction happens because if uh, there's an oscillating dipole in a solid, it creates a long range electric field. This is a macroscopic electric field, typically caused by the longitudinal optical forms in polar materials. And here, the interaction strength goes as one over Q, uh, where Q is the photon momentum. So if Q goes to zero, this type of interaction diverges to infinity. Uh, so on the right, right side here, we have the PSO electric or the quadrupole electron photon interaction. And this type of interaction happens because if a material has a non-zero dynamical quadrupole, it also can generate a macroscopic long-range electric field in a solid. This type of interaction happens for all modes in PSO electric materials and also uh, optical modes for non piezo electron materials such as diamond or silicon. And here, the electron photon matrix elements goes as a constant value as the photon momentum goes to zero. These type of interactions can also be incorporated in perturbo. And let me tell you how uh, we can interpolate these long range electron photon interactions. The key idea here is to separate from the total electron photon matrix elements the short range parts and the long range part. So you see here, this is the total electron photon matrix elements. We uh, make this into sum of two, the short range part and the long range part. The long range part, the analytical form of the long range part is largely known in the literature. For example, this is the Avenue uh, dipole Frohli interaction and its analytical formula uh, in the 3D, 3D uh, material case. So, it's given in this expression here, but the essence is that if we know the Born effective charge and uh, the dielectric constant, the electric tensor, then this long range part is known. If you want to know, know more about the other types of materials, other types of long range interactions, uh, you can refer to uh, these references for 3D uh, Frawley interaction or 2D Frawley interactions or uh, PS electric electron interactions. So, what we do here is to Compute the short range part by subtracting out the long range part from the total electron photon matrix elements. And then do a Fourier interpolation of the short range part to get uh, the short range in arbitrary k and qubits. And then we add back the long range part because this form is known analytically. So let me give you an example. These are the interpolation of the electron photon matrix elements in gallium arsenide and molybdenum disulfide. Uh, so as you can see here, the results from density function of perturbation theory are in black markers, and the interpolated results are in uh, solid red ones. So interpolation results are very good agreement with the direct density function of perturbation theory results. So uh, especially at the gamma point here, this is due to the longitudinal optical quantum modes uh, in both gallium arsenide and MOS2. So perturbo can accurately capture these Frawley interaction in both in 3D and 2D cases. And note that this is very sharp in the gamma point, which means it's uh, flat or long range in the real space basis. Next is the interpolation of the uh, quadrupole electron photon matrix elements. I'll use silicon uh, PBTI3 and gallium nitride as an example. If you just used Vanier functions for the dipole matrix elements, then the interpolated results are in blue curves here. They do not match the direct EFPT results. That's for all materials here. If we include these quadruple interactions, now 
the uh, interpolated results are matching the direct results. This is true for optical modes for nonpolar materials and optical and acoustic modes for piezoelectric materials such as uh, PVTiO3 or gallium dichloride. So Perturbo can now accurately capture the piezoelectric electron phonon interactions. Um, this type of interactions are currently in a development version of Perturbo, so uh, it will be released in the future uh, versions of Perturbo. So, okay, now I'll move on to the second part. That's the first principles of electron phonon interactions beyond a normal density function theory. I'll first talk about the GW correction and then move on to spin polarized systems, spin, spin over coupling, and correlated electron systems. So, how do we uh, compute the electron phonon interaction within the GW band correction? Uh, so, first of all, why do we need GW band correction? That's because for certain materials, GW correction has a significant impact. For example, let's use, let's see the NA3PI, uh, 3D topological, topological uh, semi metal that we have recently studied. If you use DFT, then the band velocity of the conduction bands are largely underestimated. And we need the GW corrections to get the correct uh, electron velocity in the conduction band. So how do we compute this? Well, this is a workflow for incorporating these GW eigenvalues. We start from the DFT band structure, but we do not generate the maximally localized finite functions directly from the G DFT results. We start from DFT and feed this electronic structure into a GW uh, GW code such as YAMBO or Berkeley GW or any other GW code of your choice. And then from this GW eigen correction, we compute the maximally localized value functions using the GW uh, electronic structure. And the rest of the workflow are very similar to the ones that I described you before. So Perturbo can accurately capture these electron phonon interaction within, uh, including the GW band gap, effective mass, and electron velocity. Next is electron phonon interaction in spin polarized systems. In spin polarized systems, up and down spin subspaces can be separated using if you use LSD8. So up spins and down spins are completely independent in this case, and so are the electron phonon matrix elements. Electron phonon matrix elements in up space and down space can be separated here too. So for example, this is the LSD8 band structure of iron. Uh, and as you can see, the up, up spin and down spin has different band structures uh, sharing the same uh, Fermi level. So what we do is compute the spin down subspace electron phonon matrix elements and spin up space electron phonon matrix elements using two different, uh, two different uh, this interpolation workflow. And Perturbo can accurately compute these electron phonon matrix interactions in spin polarized systems. Next, I'll talk about electron phonon interaction with spin orbit coupling. Uh, so spin orbit coupling can be very complex in materials. For example, this is the visualization of the Dirsenhout spin orbit coupling in 3-5 semiconductors. Um, and here, the wave functions are represented in two component spinners, and the phonon perturbations are represented in two by two matrices in spin basis. Nonetheless, we can construct this electron phonon matrix elements using this basis. So the general workflow uh, goes like this. First, we use density function theory and density function perturbation theory with fully relativistic pseudopotentials to compute electrons and phonons. And then we rotate and interpolate the electron phonon matrix elements using crystal plus SU2 symmetry. So for the, for the electron phonon matrix elements in the irreducible wedge of the Berlin zone, we compute them directly. But for the ones that are not in the irreducible Berlin zone, we use crystal symmetry to fold out the uh, phonon perturbation potential using the ones in the irreducible Berlin zone. This involves the O3 group and the SU2 group to rotate the real, real space parts and the spin space parts. But this SU2 part is very essential in obtaining the electron phonon matrix elements. So if we include the SU2 parts, then now the electron phonon matrix elements follow the crystal uh, symmetry, but if there are no SU2 involved, then it can give very uncontrolled errors in the interpolation and also the cut connection. So now 
which are can accurately compute electron volume interactions, including uh, spearmid coupling. And lastly, I'll go and talk about the ab initio electron photon interaction and correlated electron systems. I'll go a little bit deeper in this case. So for correlated electron systems, there are many interesting phenomena. There could be high TC superconductivity, mod transition, multiphorosity, giant magnet resistance. However, the electron phonon workflow that I described you, that I told you before, cannot be used as is here. That's because TFT fails to capture the ground state of these materials. There are many reasons why TFT fails. One of the major reasons is the self-interaction error caused by the partially filled P orbitals uh, because TFT is mainly a mean field. One of the major routes to mitigate this error is to use the Hubbard corrected density function theory within the framework of TFT plus C. So, how does this work? So let me give you an example. Uh, and I'll tell you about the ground state and the phonons in a mod insulator from the FD plus zero. Um, and I'll use cobalt oxide, which is a transition metal oxide. That's an antiferromagnetic mod insulator and DFT fails to describe the ground state. If you use DFT to, to just compute the ground state, then it predicts it to be incorrectly uh, metal. If you use the Hubbard corrected density function of theory, DFT plus U, then now it correctly predicts it to be a wide band gap material with a band gap of 2.5 electron volts, as you can see in this density of states graph here. Now, recently there has been significant advances in the phonon part, the linear response version of the corrected density function of theory. And now uh, phonons can be very accurately computed here. So if you use density function of perturbation theory, the plane DFT, now it incorrectly predicts this to be a, a unstable metal, but now if you use DFPT plus U, it correct it predicts it to be a stable metal. Uh, the electron phonon interactions within these frameworks were not possible, so we have developed an electron phonon interaction within the framework of DFT plus U. How does that work? Well, the electron phonon matrix element that we show here. The wave functions are computed from the Hubbard corrected DFT plus U uh, framework, and the phonon perturbation potentials and the energies are computed from DFT plus U. So the phonon perturbation potential now consists of two parts. First one is a consham uh, potential part that's uh, basically driven by the charge density response. And there's an additional part that's due to the Hubbard U correction, and this part governs the hopping between. Uh, partially filled 3D orbitals. And the Hubbard U value can be determined ab initio or with the linear response approach. And we have implemented a workflow to interpolate this in perturbo, which involve technical challenges, such as um, computing electron photon matrix elements and irreducible points, unfolding it to reducible points and making interpolations into finer uh, G codes. This is kind of a challenge common for cobalt oxide and many uh, but it's common for other classes of materials. So this is electron phonon interaction computed within the DFPT plus U. And it turns out that this Hubbard U correction has a dramatic effect. If you just use the plain DFPT, then it fails to capture the long range electron phonon interaction. And the Frawley interaction are absent in this case. If you use DFPT plus U, now the interpolated results correctly predicts the Frawley interaction in this case. Also, if you use DFPT, then there are artificial soft modes that diverge to infinity, where the phonon eigenvalue becomes imaginary. And these kind of artificial uh, divergences are removed uh, if we use density function perturbation theory uh, plus U. So this kind of interaction is currently uh, in a development phase, and it will be included in the future release of return. So to summarize lecture two, we have briefly go went over the first principle of electron phonon interactions for carrier and transport dynamics. Perturbo can accurately capture the short and long range electron phonon interactions, and it can capture the electron phonon interpolation with GW band spins and some coordinated electrons. 
and it can be used to study broad range of materials with comprehensive analysis. So thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions.